Welcome back to another presentation on the capital asset pricing model. Uh, in this presentation, we're going to move on from the discussion of diversifiable versus non-diversifiable risk from the prior presentation. And then we're going to move towards an equation which we can use to estimate discount rates. And that equation is called the capital asset pricing model. Now, some of you may already be familiar with this equation, but let me give you a summary of it before we move into assumptions and how we get to this equation. The equation says that the expected return on any asset, that is the discount rate, is equal to two parts. The risk-free rate of interest plus a premium for bearing systematic risk. Non-systematic risk, also called diversifiable risk, doesn't factor into discount rates at all. And in that risk premium for bearing systematic risk, there are itself, there are in turn two components. One is the beta component, or the beta factor. One is the market risk premium. Now we introduced the concept of the market risk premium in an earlier class. We looked at historical returns on the equity market minus the risk-free rate. Recall that we said that that computation we did, which was about 7% for the US market, was just an analysis of historical returns relative to government bond yields. That's one proxy for the market risk premium. It's not the market risk premium in quotation marks. It's an estimate of the market risk premium. The concept of the market risk premium that's embedded in the capital asset pricing model is the entire market for all risky assets is going to have some return and that return is going to be relative to the risk-free rate of interest. So you could say for example that you estimate that the entire market of all risky assets like shares, government bonds, corporate bonds, sorry, go, um, artwork, wine, real estate, that entire proportion of all risky assets is going to have some aggregate return and if you take away the risk-free rate of interest, you're going to get a market risk premium. Government bond yields are not the risk-free rate of interest. They are themselves a proxy for the risk-free rate of interest because that's the closest thing that we can identify that has a risk-free rate of return. So we have an equation that says the cost of capital for any asset is the risk-free rate plus beta for that asset times the market risk premium. Beta is going to be asset specific. So we're going to say we have a beta estimate for a share in Domino's. We're going to have a beta estimate for um, a share in McDonald's. We're going to have a beta estimate for the corporate bonds issued by Ford. We're going to have a beta estimate for the wine produced by Behringer Wineries. We're going to have a beta estimate for any individual asset. But the market risk premium component of the capital asset pricing model is a market-wide parameter. The market risk premium estimate that you would use in any particular circumstance doesn't vary depending upon any characteristics of the individual asset. So if I was estimating a discount rate for Domino shares or McDonald's shares or Ford corporate bonds or Behringer wines, if I was estimating a discount rate for any of these individual assets, I'd have the same estimate for the market risk premium. Well, before we get into more details about that equation, we haven't even written it down yet, let's talk about how we get to that equation with some assumptions. To understand the capital asset pricing model, you have to recall, like I mentioned in the prior presentation, that it was developed in the 1960s, more than 50 years ago, by some very clever researchers to explain how the market comes up with different prices for different assets. To flip that analysis around, it's a way of explaining how the market comes up with discount rates on different assets. And this is a very complex problem. And with any complex problem, we want to try to simplify the problem by making a series of assumptions, simplifying assumptions. And one at a time, you relax those assumptions to make the analysis more realistic and incrementally determine how you might change your analysis on the basis of those real world assumptions. So when these clever researchers, and three of them are Sharp, Lintner and Mossen, came up with the capital asset pricing model, they assumed a perfect capital market and they also assumed that all investors have the same expectations for the risk of every asset, the covariance of returns for, between every pair of assets and 
the expected return on every asset. So they assume that investors have the same set of information, they make the same assumptions about how asset prices are going to move together, they make the same assumptions about volatility of individual assets. They're working with the same information set. A perfect capital market means that there's no impediments to trade. That means there's infinite liquidity, there's no transaction costs, there's no ambiguity about what's correct and incorrect information. There's no financial distress costs, that is consumers and businesses and executives and employees don't behave any differently depending upon whether they were in distress or not in distress. So in this perfect capital market, in which investors all have the same expectations, those assumptions are ultimately going to lead to the equation which is still forthcoming. Now that's a bit of a tease, right? It's going to be coming up next. It's like an episode of Lost. No, wait, that's a bit too, you're a bit too young for Lost. Anyway, doesn't matter, I digress. When the capital asset pricing was, model was developed, the researchers said all investors are risk averse. That's something that we can get our minds around. We all prefer higher returns and lower risk. They assumed all investors have rational expectations and importantly, they assumed there was just one period for analysis. They assumed, to keep the maths really simple, they assume that investors are going to form expectations, they're going to trade assets in this marketplace, the prices are going to be set in this efficient manner, they're going to hold the assets for one single period, and then the game ends. People consume the wealth, and everyone dies. Right? It's over. We've, we're finished. Now what happened after the model was developed was that pr practitioners had a practical problem. They said we have to use this equation to estimate discount rates. It seems like a really neat idea. But in the real world, we don't have a single period. We break up time into these multiple time periods, typically a year, and we have to estimate discount rates based upon some real world noisy data. What you consider to be the period in the capital asset pricing model could be one year, or you could say the period in that model is the life of the investment. Maybe it's 100 years, maybe it's 30 years, depending upon investment characteristics. But you start going down a path where you take this very simple, nuanced theory, I should say it's not nuanced, a very simple theory of discount rates made under this very set of restrictive assumptions, and then you impose some noise in the information based upon real world estimation error. So we don't know for certain what's the market risk premium. We don't have a perfect proxy for the risk-free rate. We don't have perfect measurements of beta. They themselves are very noisy. And crucially, and I cannot stress this enough, the capital asset pricing model is biased, imprecise, and incomplete. That means it underestimates the return on low beta stocks and overestimates required returns on high beta stocks. We'll talk about that again in forthcoming presentations. It is imprecise in that our estimates of beta, the risk-free rate, and market risk premium are estimated with a very high degree of error, and it is incomplete. And incompleteness means that it ignores some risks that we know actually matter. It ignores liquidity. It ignores uh, risk related to information. It ignores risk related to financial distress. There are many risks which are not captured by the capital asset pricing model, which researchers have established are relevant for the way the market prices assets and therefore sets discount rates. So this gives you an idea that the capital asset pricing model is going to have limitations, but we need a starting point to understand how markets work. So bear that in mind. If we don't start with this set of simplifying assumptions that we have a perfect capital market, and every investor has the same information set and forms the same set of aggregate views on risk and expected return, based upon that information set, we don't get anywhere. We can't make a start in understanding how markets work. So that's our starting point, but don't take it as gospel as the truth. It's a starting point for understanding risk and discount rates. So first of all, the most crucial assumption is that all investors end up forming the same efficient frontier. Recall that in an earlier class we developed the idea of the efficient frontier. We said there's an investment opportunity set of all risky assets, 
and some portfolios of those assets plot along the extremity of that scatter plot and offer the highest expected return for the same level of risk. Well, in the capital asset pricing model world, because all investors have the same information, they all end up with the same efficient frontier estimate. So if you did some analysis and I did some analysis and your colleague did some analysis, we all end up drawing the same graph. Now, in reality, that doesn't happen. In reality, investors have different expectations for risk and return. So we all end up drawing a different efficient frontier. But that's a real world assumption. That's not part of the capital asset pricing model framework. There's no disagreement. But which of the portfolios we end up holding along that efficient frontier, they change depending upon our risk preference. And I said in the earlier presentation, if you have reasonably high risk tolerance, you don't mind extra risk, you'll end up holding a high risk, high return portfolio. If you have fairly low risk tolerance, so you're highly risk averse, you end up holding a low return, low risk portfolio along that curve. And that's illustrated in this chart here. In the top part of the slide, you can see the stylized version of the efficient frontier. It's just a series of dots that represent the investment opportunity set and a diagram showing the efficient frontier. But to illustrate that idea, we formed portfolios of this three asset universe, Nike, Merck and Boeing. We said suppose that there were many, many different portfolios that we could form, form illustrated by the red dots showing their volatility and expected return. And we said there is a subset of portfolios which plot along the extremity, which offer the highest expected return for each level of risk shown by the green dots. So in our real world, small market setting of three assets, that would represent the efficient frontier. Now, if investors have homogenous expectations, so we all believe the same truth, and if there are no impediments to trade, that is a perfect capital market, then we all have the same efficient frontier, regardless of whether we had a small market or a, a large market stylized version. So there's agreement on the suite of portfolios that are efficient, that offer the highest expected return for each level of risk. And because we have agreement about that, that's going to have some profound implications. Investors are going to be well diversified, but we're going to hold different portfolios depending upon our risk tolerance. And bear that point in mind for upcoming discussion. We're going to hold different portfolios even though we have the same expectations for risk and return. We have different risk preferences. As an application, suppose we consider the larger market that we had before. Recall that I found 29 securities from the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Suppose we expand our market from three individual stocks to these 29 stocks. And we all agree on the assumptions relating to risk and return and of each asset and covariances. So each individual asset, these 29 assets are plotted in this chart. You can see Apple has standard deviation of about 26% and expected return of 6.6%. Procter & Gamble has low volatility and a higher expected return. All 29 assets are plotted. Now suppose I generate 100 portfolios from those 29 securities by randomly assigning different portfolio weights. Now I could have illustrated this analysis with a thousand portfolios, a million portfolios, but a hundred's gonna make the point. So portfolio outcomes in red show substantial risk reduction from any individual stock. The dark blue points represent individual stocks, risk and return profile. The red dots on the left hand side represent portfolios. And you can see here just by randomly assigning these stocks to portfolios, the vast majority of portfolios that we've randomly generated have lower risk than the individual assets. But the average return hasn't really shifted. The average return across all of these individual assets is about 8.5%. The average return of the portfolios is about 8.5%. Just by randomly coming up with different portfolios, we can lower risk, but without any reduction in our expected return. Now let's move on. Let's zoom in on those red dots in the slide to come up with a subsample of portfolios which we would deem to be efficient. The nine portfolios 
plotted in green represent the efficient frontier, if we could only hold these 100 different random portfolios, because they show the subset of those 100 portfolios that for each level of volatility offer the highest, highest expected return. You can see that each time volatility goes up, the, the expected return goes up. Now it's not perfectly linear, but if you join those dots together, there's always a slightly higher expected return for an increase in risk. And that's why it's the efficient frontier in our pretend universe. Now we could have generated 10,000 portfolios, a million portfolios, and again, we would have had a small subset of portfolios which are efficient, and the, it would have looked more like a curve. It would have been smoother. And there are computer programs which you can write which allow you to do those computations even in Excel. So don't think for a moment that any of this is beyond your technical capabilities. Uh, within uh, a few weeks of exposure to programming and some more corporate finance knowledge, everyone in this class would be able to produce an efficient frontier based upon many combinations of individual risky assets. But we're pretending at the moment that this is the whole investment opportunity set. What are we going to do with this efficient frontier? Well, to get to the capital asset pricing model, we're going to introduce another important assumption. It's the risk-free rate of interest. Under the previous analysis, we ended up at the point where depending upon our risk preference, we hold different portfolios. Someone who hates risk, has high risk aversion, buys the lowest volatility, lowest return portfolio. Someone who doesn't mind more risk, has a high risk tolerance, buys the high volatility, high expected return portfolio. But we're all holding different portfolios. We're gonna see that once we introduce the idea that all investors can borrow and lend at the risk-free rate of interest, then we're gonna end up all holding the same risky portfolio. And if we end up all holding the same risky portfolio, the only optimal portfolio that we could possibly hold is gonna end up being the market portfolio of all risky assets. And if we're all holding the fully diversified market portfolio of all risky assets, then the only risk factor which we're gonna care about in coming up with prices for those assets is going to be systematic risk. We're not gonna care about asset-specific risk because none of us are going to be exposed to asset-specific risk. So let's see what happens if we introduce the idea of the risk-free rate of interest. Now this is a theoretical concept, but as we talked earlier about earlier, we have to make simplifying assumptions to develop an understanding of how markets work. Your textbook, and I will talk about borrowing and lending at the risk-free rate of interest. Lending at the risk-free rate means you have a positive weight in the risk-free asset. So for example, if I go to the US Treasury website and I buy a government bond, I'm lending the government money. Now the risk-free asset isn't actually a government bond. The government bond is just a proxy we're using to measure the risk-free rate of interest. But it's easier to explain it if, as if I just say I'm buying a government bond. If I buy a government bond, I'm lending the US government possibly $1,000 to invest in its own projects. Borrowing at the risk-free rate means a negative weight in the risk-free asset. And by extension, it means a weight greater than one in a risky portfolio because the weight of my aggregate portfolio has to sum to one. Now this is a theoretical concept because I can't borrow at the risk-free rate of interest. Sure, I can lend to the government at the risk-free rate of interest, I can buy government bonds, but who amongst you or who, who amongst my friends or financial institutions or the government is going to lend to me at one or 2%, the risk-free rate of return? I, I might default. Now, I'm not intending to default. I hope I've got enough character to intend to pay, but if I became financially distressed, or if any of you became financially distressed enough, eventually you would probably default because you would have high priorities. So people don't, in the real world, 
they are not able to borrow at the risk-free rate of interest. They're able to lend the risk-free rate of interest because there is a very low probability that governments in developed, mature economies are actually going to default. And some governments default. Russia has defaulted. Argentina has defaulted. Brazil has defaulted. Um, some other economies in Europe have either defaulted or gone close to default. Sometimes governments default. But the US government or the Australian government or the UK government hasn't defaulted on its financial obliga obligations. But even so, the key point is that an assumption of the capital asset pricing model is that everyone can borrow and lend at their risk-free rate of interest. And that assumption is not true, but we're going to go with it just for the next 15 minutes. Now suppose that we've introduced this risk-free rate of interest. What that means is that we can now construct another theoretical portfolio which is comprised of two parts. The first part comprise, comprises of a risky component. That first part is going to be some combination of many risky assets. The second part of that portfolio is going to be the risk-free rate of interest. So if you look at our scatter plot from earlier, each of those green dots could be the risky component of the two asset portfolio. The risk-free rate is going to be another asset that we can introduce into this two asset portfolio. So I'm going to combine a risky component, which could be some combination of Merck, Nike, Boeing and many other listed companies, with the risk-free component, which is as a proxy a government bond yield, but it's not actually a government bond yield. It's something which is completely risk-free. What does this mean for the expected return and volatility of this new portfolio, which is a combination of the risk-free asset and the risky component of the portfolio. Now that's a two asset portfolio. Let's work out the expected return of this two asset portfolio first. The expected return of any portfolio, which we covered a few classes ago, is a weighted average of the expected return on each individual asset within the portfolio. Our new portfolio is a two asset portfolio. It has a risk-free rate and a risky component. So the expected return on this risky two asset portfolio is now the weight on the risk-free asset times the expected return of the risk-free asset plus the weight on the risky component of the portfolio multiplied by the expected return on the risky component of the portfolio. So that's our expected return. It's just a weighted average of the returns on the risk-free asset and the risky component, in which the weights are just how much money on a relative basis we've invested in those two assets. What about the volatility of this new portfolio? We went through a very well-defined process for estimating the volatility of any portfolio. We said, we're gonna construct the portfolio variance matrix. And the portfolio variance matrix, we're gonna come up with a grid, and each asset is gonna go down the rows, and each asset is gonna go across the columns. And within each cell of that portfolio variance matrix, we're gonna write the same thing. We're gonna take the weight that we've invested in the asset in the row, times the weight we've invested in the asset in the column, and multiply that by the covariance of returns on that pair of assets. Let's apply that idea of a two asset portfolio to a combination of the risk-free asset and a risky component of the portfolio, which of course is in turn a combination of many risky individual assets. Let's take the top right hand, top left hand corner. The asset in the row is the risk-free asset, and the asset in the column is the risk-free asset. We're gonna populate our portfolio variance matrix with the weight of the risk-free asset times the weight of the risk-free asset, that's in the column, times the variance of returns for the risk-free asset. That is the covariance of returns on the risk-free asset with itself. Now that variance has to be zero, because by definition, this is the risk-free asset. It doesn't change the return on that investment under any circumstances. If it's a 2% risk-free return, 
it's a 2% risk-free return regardless of whether the market's up or down, regardless of who wins the Super Bowl, regardless of whether we have you know, a virus affecting many people around the world or not. It's a risk-free return by definition. So it has no variance, it has no standard deviation. So the top left-hand corner is zero. Let's look at the bottom right-hand corner. We've got the risky component of the portfolio in the row. We've got the risky component of the portfolio in the column. We're gonna multiply those two together and multiply by the covariance of returns on the risky component with itself. Well, that's just the variance of returns on the risky component. So what we have in the bottom right-hand corner is the weight of the risky asset squared, the risky component squared, times the variance of returns on the risky component. In the off diagonal elements, like in the bottom left-hand corner and in the top right-hand corner, we're gonna take the weight of the risky component of the portfolio, multiplied by the weight of the risk-free asset times the covariance of the risky component with the risk-free asset. The covariance of returns between that pair of assets must also be zero, because what we said is that the risk-free asset is gonna have the same return no matter what happens to anything else in the marketplace. So regardless of whether the risky component of the asset of the portfolio is going up or down, in any given week or month or year, we have the same return on the risk-free asset. There's no covariance, so both the bottom left-hand corner and the top right-hand corner of our portfolio variance matrix are equal to zero. So if you were to aggregate all these cells within that portfolio variance matrix, what would you have? All you would have left over is the bottom left-hand cell in the grid. And that tells you that the variance of returns on that two asset portfolio is gonna be the weight in the risky component multiplied by the variance of returns on the risky component. The standard deviation of returns in that portfolio is the square root of the variance. So that's gonna be standard deviation of returns equals the weight on the risky component multiplied by the standard deviation of returns on the risky component. So in summary, here is the expected return on a portfolio which is a combination of the risk-free rate and a risk-free risky component. It's gonna be a weighted average of the returns on those two different parts of the portfolio, and the volatility is gonna be the weight on the risky component multiplied by the standard deviation of returns on the risky component. And that assumption is gonna be very important in coming up with the equation, which we call the capital asset pricing model. Now that we have the risk-free asset, there is gonna be a large number of combinations of the risk-free asset and many different risky portfolios. Let's go back to our practical application. Remember that I said all of these green dots represent portfolios which an individual investor could possibly invest in? Suppose that the expected return on the risk-free asset was down here in the graph at around about 2%. You could combine this risk-free portfolio with this risky component A or this risky component B or this risky component C, there are many different risky components which could be combined with the risk-free rate of interest, which is gonna have no standard deviation, it's actually gonna plot way to the left here, and a low return. If I was to graph as a combination all these risky portfolios in combination with the risk-free rate of interest, I could have a graph showing me many different portfolios. If this is my old efficient frontier, represented by those green dots on the previous slide, and I combine the risk-free rate of interest with many of those portfolios, there could be a combination of the risk-free rate of interest and this portfolio here, which I'll call A, and depending upon the weights that we have within that two asset portfolio, we could have 100% invested in the risk-free rate of interest, we've got to have 100% invested in asset A, 
at these intermediate points, we could have, say, 50% invested in the risk-free asset and 50% in portfolio A. And at this upper right-hand section of the graph, we could have, say, minus 150%, minus 50% in the risk-free asset and plus 150% in asset A. How do I know that all these portfolios plot along that line in combination with asset A? Well, I know that from the grid we compiled five minutes ago. We said that the expected return on the two asset portfolio is a weighted average of the expected return on the risk-free asset and some risky component. And if the risky component is A, the expected return is just gonna be a weighted average of those two individual expected returns. So as you shift more weight in some portfolio towards the risk-free asset, you're gonna plot further downwards to the left. As you shift more weight in your portfolio towards portfolio A, a risky portfolio, you're gonna have portfolios which plot upwards to the right-hand side. In terms of volatility, we said that the volatility of returns is just gonna be the weight that you have in the risky component of the portfolio multiplied by the standard deviation of returns on that risky portfolio. The risk-free rate's not gonna factor into the volatility. If I've got 100% of my investment in risky asset A, the standard deviation is gonna be this point on the graph. If I have nothing in investment A and 100% of my wealth in the risk-free asset, standard deviation is going to be zero. If I have lots of money invested in the risk, risky component and a negative weight in the risk-free asset, so I'm borrowing money at the risk-free rate, I'm gonna have an increase in standard deviation. So this computation of the expected return on a two asset portfolio in which one asset is the risk-free rate and the standard deviation is the weight on the risky component times the standard deviation of returns on the risky component, that portfolio variance matrix is what leads to this combination of the risk-free asset and a risky component having this linear relationship between standard deviation and expected returns. But let's take that one step further. No one's gonna combine risky asset A with the risk-free rate of interest. You know why they're not gonna do that? Because they're rational. And rational people want higher expected returns for the same level of risk. There's only one risky component that lies along that efficient frontier which any rational investor is gonna combine with the risk-free rate of interest. And that's gonna be a portfolio which plots at point X on this graph at which there is a tangential line between the risk-free rate and portfolio X. Now the reason all of us are going to hold portfolio X in combination with the risk-free rate of interest is because we can do better than holding portfolio A and indeed do better than holding portfolio A or portfolio B or portfolio C in any combination with the risk-free rate of interest. Suppose you like holding portfolio A because you don't mind a bit of risk. You have high risk tolerance. You've got lots of ability to recover from a downturn. You like portfolio A. But then I say, but wait a minute, I've got this new security you can buy. If you borrow money at the risk-free rate of interest and you invest that money in portfolio X, that combination of borrowing and the risk-free rate of interest is gonna end up as a new portfolio Y which plots up here on our graph. And portfolio Y dominates portfolio X. Portfolio Y is better because it offers a higher expected return for the same level of risk as portfolio A. So you'd like to portfolio A because you have a high risk tolerance, but now I offer you something which has the same risk, but higher prospective returns. And it beats portfolio A. Now suppose one of your friends is a bit more risk averse. And this person's more risk averse, so likes holding portfolio C. But you say to your friend, wait a minute, I've got this new idea. You can do better. If you invest some of your money in the risk-free asset and some of your money in portfolio X, you can do better than portfolio C. Because putting half of your money in the risk-free asset and half of your money in portfolio X 
is going to be a new portfolio, portfolio Z, which plots along this point of the chart. That portfolio dominates portfolio C because it offers the same expected return, but at lower risk. So regardless of your risk preference, whether you are highly risk averse or you are more risk tolerant, and so you like portfolio A, regardless of whether you like portfolio C to begin with or portfolio A, once you introduce the ability to borrow and lend at the risk-free rate of interest, we can do better. All of us end up holding risky portfolio X in combination with the risk-free asset. Those of us who have high risk aversion, we don't like risk, lend at the risk-free rate of interest, which means we invest in the risk-free asset. Those of us who are more risk tolerant, we have a lower degree of risk aversion, we borrow money at the risk-free rate of interest, invest more money in portfolio X, and end up holding portfolios which plot upwards to the right of this graph. And that's why it's called the new efficient frontier. Because it's some combination of a risky component with the risk-free rate of interest, which dominates the old efficient frontier. Let's show that in a real world case. Recall that we had these many assets that we could invest in. We had 29 individual assets. Then we combined those 29 individual assets into portfolios. Those are the red dots. Then we took a subset of those red dots, these portfolios, and said there's a subset of those investments which are efficient. They offer the highest expected return for the same level of risk. And then if we zoom in, we say if we combine one of those risky portfolios with the risk-free rate of interest, which in my example is assumed to be 3%, then I can form a new suite of possible investment portfolios, which is the new efficient frontier. So in my practical example, the blue dots are the individual assets. They were from the 29 stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The red dots represents a set of possible portfolios from those individual assets. So the individual assets plus the portfolios, that's their investment opportunity set. The green dots represent the old efficient frontier. They are the portfolios which offer the highest expected return for each level of risk that we could form. But then with a risk-free rate of 3%, there is only one of those risky portfolios which is efficient. If we combine this particular risky portfolio with the risk-free rate of interest, if you have a high degree of risk aversion, you invest more money in the risk-free asset, so you hold a portfolio somewhere down to the left-hand side. If you have a high degree of risk tolerance, you hold some portfolio which plots upwards to the right. But all of us, because we can borrow and lend at the risk-free rate of interest, hold the same risky component of the portfolio. In our example, the expected return of that portfolio was 8.51%. 8 it has volatility of 12.96%, and it has a sharp ratio of 0.42. The sharp ratio is the gap between the expected return on a portfolio and the risk-free rate of interest, divided by the volatility of that portfolio. You can think of it as an incremental return per unit of risk. So for every percent return above the risk-free rate, there is going to be point, uh, sorry, for every incremental unit of volatility, there is going to be 0.42% extra return. All right, if I move upwards to the right-hand side here and I take on 10% um, more volatility, I'm going to have 4.2% higher expected return. So now, finally, let's get to the capital asset pricing model. Once we have the implication that all of us in this investment universe hold the same risky component of our portfolio, you know what that portfolio is? There's only one possibility. It's the market portfolio of all risky assets. And you know why it's the market portfolio of all risky assets? 
and I say it's all the stocks, bonds, real estate, art, horses, restaurants, basketball teams, etc., held in proportion to their market value, because that's the fully diversified portfolio. It's the only possible portfolio we could form, because remember we started with the idea that none of us have any information advantage. We've all got the same information set. We all form the same expectations for expected return and volatility and covariances. So if no one can end up beating anybody else with superior information, any time and money we spend on research of individual assets is wasted. We're not gonna take on any asset-specific risk as a, to you know, trade off the information we have because everyone else has that information too. The best course of action that we have is to be fully diversified. If I can't earn higher returns with my skill in analysis, if I can't earn higher returns with my information advantage, I may as well lower risk by being as well diversified as possible. And if I'm completely diversified, that means that I'm holding the market portfolio of all risky assets. And under this simplified world, we're all holding the market portfolio of all risky assets, and that means nobody cares anymore in pricing those assets about unsystematic risk. We're fully diversified, and if we don't have any diversifiable risk, it won't affect what we pay for any asset. And therefore, it won't affect our required returns on investment in coming up with those prices. And finally, that leads to the only risk that's factored into discount rates being systematic risk which leads to an equation which is loosely derived on the following slides. I say loosely derived because this isn't a pure mathematical proof of the model. A mathematical proof of the model is beyond the scope of our class, so this is a loose explanation for where we come up with the capital asset pricing model equation. The line you see illustrated here is the capital market line. The capital market line represents a line which is tangential to the market portfolio. That market portfolio is the only portfolio that all of us are going to form, which is fully diversified and we're going to hold in combination with the risk-free rate of interest. And we said investors who dislike risk the most lend at the risk-free rate and their portfolio is plopped somewhere to the bottom left on the capital market line. Investors who are a bit more risk tolerant borrow money and invest more in the market portfolio and their portfolios plot in the upper right hand corner of the capital market line. All combinations of the market portfolio and the risk free rate of interest lie on the capital market line. So where does the equation come from for the capital asset pricing model? Every portfolio we could possibly form has the same sharp ratio. The sharp ratio is the slope of the line. Right? The sharp ratio is the incremental return on investment relative to the risk-free rate. So in this example, where we're all holding the market portfolio, that numerator is RM, the expected market return, minus the risk-free rate of interest, divided by the standard deviation of returns on the market portfolio. So the first equation on the slide is for the sharp ratio in general, which you could apply to every portfolio in a real world sense. The equation on the bottom of the slide is the unique application of the sharp ratio to the market portfolio, where the portfolio in question happens to be the market portfolio. The numerator represents the market risk premium. It's the expected market return minus the risk-free rate of interest. The denominator is volatility, that is standard deviation of returns on the market portfolio. So you can think of the sharp ratio as a reward for risk ratio. It's the extra return that we're getting above our risk free rate of interest for each additional unit of volatility. To get to our equation, and I say it's a loose derivation, we go one step further and say the expected return on any individual asset, which I've labeled as asset I, is equal to the risk-free rate of interest plus the beta of asset I times the market risk premium. And here's, how, here's where we emphasize that the beta estimate is unique to asset I. It's unique to shares in Domino's or shares in McDonald's 
or um, corporate bonds issued by Ford or an investment in Berridge and Wine Estates. That all of those assets have a different beta estimate. That's what asset I is. The expected return on the market portfolio minus the risk-free rate, that's the market risk premium. And that is common for any investment that you're going to make. It's the expected return on the market portfolio minus the risk-free rate. It's got nothing to do with any individual asset. Now it's important that you drill that into your minds because there is a significant proportion of students that I see in finance electives when we do exercises where they want to have a different definition of the market risk premium depending upon whether they're analysing small stocks or large stocks or corporate bonds or some other type of asset. We don't want to go down that path. It's not part of the capital asset pricing model. Small stocks and large stocks and corporate bonds, those may have different beta estimates because that's something specific to the asset. But the market risk premium component and the risk-free component of the capital asset pricing model, they are independent of any individual asset. They are market-wide parameters. So we say the expected return on any asset, like shares in McDonald's, is equal to the risk-free rate of interest plus the beta of the asset, which could be the beta of shares in McDonald's, times the market risk premium. In turn, the beta of any individual asset I is given by the following equation. It's going to be the covariance of returns on that individual asset with the returns on the market portfolio of all risky assets divided by the variance of returns on the market portfolio. Another way that you can write that, if you recall that covariance is correlation times the product of two standard deviations, is to say that the beta of some asset I like shares in McDonald's, is equal to the correlation of, share, of investment I with the market returns, which I'll illustrate as rho subscript I M times the standard deviation of returns on asset I times the standard deviation of returns on the market portfolio, which I'll illustrate with sigma I and sigma M, divided by the variance of returns on the market portfolio. And that's often illustrated as sigma m squared. So we could say that beta of some asset is its covariance of returns with the market returns divided by the variance of market returns. Or we could say that beta of some investment is the correlation of returns on that investment with the market returns times the standard deviation of returns on the investment times the standard deviation of returns on the market portfolio, divided by the variance of returns on the market portfolio. And we could write this one more way. You, because you've got sigma m in the numerator and sigma m in the denominator of the equation, we could write it one more way as saying this is equal to the correlation coefficient of asset i with the market portfolio times the standard deviation of returns on asset i divided by the standard deviation of returns on the market portfolio. And that, my friends, is beta. Beta is a measure of the sensitivity of securities returns, that is an asset's returns, to systematic risk. So beta is a measure of risk exposure, and beta times the market risk premium is a computation of how much extra return investors require before they're prepared to invest in an asset with that level of systematic risk exposure. And in particular, the equation for the capital asset pricing model is given by the security market line. The security market line is very similar to the capital market line, but the difference is that in the horizontal axis, we don't have total volatility. We've only got systematic risk as given by beta. This chart says that the expected return on any asset is equal to the risk-free rate plus the beta of that asset times the market risk premium. So the security market line is just a plot which shows you the equation for the capital asset pricing model expressed graphically. One of the single most common questions asked by students 
in financial management courses globally, not just at Michigan, but globally, is what's the difference between the capital market line and the security market line? The capital market line relates to portfolios. It shows you the relationship between expected returns and volatility for a fully diversified portfolio in which the risky component of that portfolio is the market portfolio of all risky assets. Key point is that on the horizontal axis, total volatility is what's represented. The security market line shows you the relationship between expected returns and beta for any individual security. So a high beta investment, like a technology stock, was going to plot upwards to the right of this chart. A low beta investment is going to plot downwards to the left of this chart. That could be, for example, a utility stock or a corporate bond. So in summary, my friends, that is the capital asset pricing model. It's given by the equation that says the expected return on some risky asset is equal to the risk-free rate of interest plus the beta of that investment times the market risk premium. The market risk premium is the expected return on all risky assets in the marketplace minus the risk-free rate of interest. That's the compensation investors want for bearing one more unit of systematic risk. Beta is an asset's exposure to systematic risk. Tech stocks have high beta, utility stocks have low beta, most investments have beta somewhere between 0.8 and 1.2. This is a theory. It is not a complete explanation for how assets are priced, and the evidence suggests that the model is biased, imprecise, and incomplete. By bias, we mean that the actual returns on those low beta investments are above what's predicted by the model, and the actual returns on high beta investments are less than predicted by the model. The model is imprecise because if you estimate beta, which we're gonna do in the next presentation, over different time periods, it bounces around normally just because of random noise in the historical data. The market risk premium is also estimated with a great deal of imprecision. Yes, we can measure historical market returns for listed companies, but that's not necessarily a precise estimate of what the expected market return is going to be in the future. And finally, the model is incomplete. Liquidity matters for asset pricing and therefore expected returns. Financial distress risks matter for asset pricing and therefore expected returns. Information risks matter for asset pricing and therefore expected returns. There are many risks that are not captured by the equation, which we know from research do matter for how assets are priced and therefore are factored into discount rates. Why doesn't the theory match reality? It's because the markets aren't perfect and we can't all borrow and lend at the risk-free rate of interest. And those were the crucial assumptions along with the fact that investors have the same expectations for risk and return, which they don't that underpin the capital asset pricing model. Later researchers have relaxed those assumptions and shown that, well, you can have other risk factors that you account for in discount rates, and things differ quite substantially once you have investors having different expectations and the fact that we can't all borrow at the risk rate of interest. The key point is that this presentation is to demonstrate that systematic risk is relevant it's something to be carefully considered when deciding what risk you should take into account in valuation. But you can't just mechanically apply this particular equation and say it's a fantastic, precise, complete model for estimating discount rates. It's a starting point, but let's not pretend that it's the end point for understanding risk as, as it flows through to valuation. That is the end of this presentation on the capital asset pricing model. In forthcoming presentations, we're gonna get a lot more practical. We're going to estimate beta, we're gonna estimate the market risk premium. We're gonna see how we can at least mitigate some of the estimation error in applying this model. I look forward to talking to you then.